um, things that we bring from the past that aren't helpful. And, and that's um, uh, really slow walking. That's a good one. Yep, it's a good one. And it's a good, it's an easy one for you to, to say to the student, if you can find slow walking in the text anywhere, please bring it to me. And I can assure you it isn't there. <laughs> I can assure you, because we went through that, I went through that journey at one point, saying it must be somewhere, look at all these people. No, and if you go to a big teacher, I went to a big teacher in Singapore once, at one of the large temples, and I went to another one um, in, in another place and said, why are we doing this? Why would we be doing this? Oh, well, it has to do with a Nietzsche. You must see a Nietzsche as deep as you possibly can. Now, see, the problem with saying that to me was I was living in the forest 24 seven in the forest for seven years. Anybody wants to understand and Nietzsche it takes about an hour's walk on a couple trails that I built. And I will have you never forgetting a Nietzsche for the rest of your life, just by showing you all the funk things in the forest and then saying, now, if you can sit down and think of anything that is not impermanent, please come back and tell me. Nobody ever does. Except I ran to Bonte that time and pounded on the door and told him after driving about 2,400 miles to Florida from New York, I told him, I found it. <laughs> he said, what are you talking about? I found something permanent in the universe. And what did you find? Impermanence is permanently affecting everything in the universe. And we sat there and giggled because it's true. There's nothing that is not affected by impermanence, see? So, but the walking, what they were saying was when you listen to Bhante recount what he did in his earlier training, spending 40 minutes to cross a room that was like 20 feet wide and 40 minutes back again, going so slow, agonizingly slow, like a ballet exercise with the heel and rolling the foot and feeling the front of the foot and the toe and this and, and the heel going up and this. And he said at one point, he thought he had it up to, he went to the teacher said, I think I have it up to 10,000 positions in the process of walking with your foot. Teacher said, very good, continue. Yes, but what for? You see? What for is the question. Do we get to anything deeper than understanding there is absolutely nothing anywhere that is untouched by the impermanence, yeah? Something that's helpful, I, I think, is, is working with eating. That, that's uh, that's very helpful because uh, it's it's constantly changing. And um, did you work with the thing about you know the Buddha had an instruction of how many times to chew the food before mm -hmm. it leaves your mouth, and mm -hmm. you chew and uh, different people you figure it out. We we were playing with it when he first when Bhante first told us about it. We were sitting. Uh, at a meal and we were playing with it and for each one of us it actually was a different amount okay so for me at that time it was 15 chews and the the water comes into the mouth the the first liquid comes in into the mouth and it starts to come in okay so the person who gobbles their food they're never going to get thin. They're never going to get, they're never going to lose weight. They're just pouring in and it's sliding down. So how did this get started? Well, the knowledge that about this chewing of the food, some people had 12, uh, 15, 19, 20, 21 times to get the water flowing. So we have a different situation in our mouth, different people. And once it's flowing, you can swallow and you get all of the juices for your digestion into your colon to effectively do digestion. If you don't chew till the water comes in your mouth, you're going to end up with problems in your intestines by the time you're older. It could be anything from tumors 
to uh, the sides, you know, closing down the function of the other juices because of things getting caught and stuff like that. You just too fast the food is going in. And then it's the ratio. The other thing about eating was the ratio in the stomach of um, having one fourth air, um, half full with the food and one fourth water, one fourth water, one fourth air and um, one half with the food in your stomach. And people overeat without the proper balance in the stomach. So then they get different problems with their stomachs. And you know, they had these medical books came down from the time of the monks. Some of them, I only have one here Bonte gave me. And um, they cover everything. All this stuff is recorded in those. And that was part of the thing that goes all the way back to Jivaka. Yeah, yeah. So the, the eating thing was another thing about balance and stuff like that. Um, what else can you think of? Hmm? Um, well, one of, one of the things that's interesting with the eating is seeing the reflex to swallow. And it's habitually trained. So the person who gobbles their food and slides it down. And I will tell you something that's very sad. In the United States, the Sri Lankan monks have a very high percentage with diabetes. And that's for happening because of the lay people making meals that are like the biggest celebratory meal their family can afford to make. And then eating that way seven days a week from people coming to the temple and giving them food. So they can't seem to avoid they, you know, this problem with high sugar content, the wrong oils, the wrong of a lot of things and, and having this very, very rich food. Okay. And um, the other thing is the monks are um, obligated when there's a, at a, when you're at a temple, they're obligated to um, finish by the time the abbot finishes. But what we forget, or the abbots forget sometimes, is that the abbot is obligated to be concerned with the stomachs of his monks and not be the fastest one to eat. If he doesn't, then the monks can get highly criticized for not being finished by the time the abbot stops eating. Sister Kema. Sure. Um, when um, you said about the slow walking, uh, would it help to uh, calm down your bodily formations and then improve your mindfulness? The problem isn't that. The problem is the concentration it takes for the slow walking and causes a tenseness in your brain. That is what's happening here. I watched what happened to the expressions on students in Malaysia in a retreat with people who insisted on going to the back of the Dhamma Hall and doing slow walking. I didn't stop them, I wanted to see something. And so I let them do it and they tense their, like this, you know, and they're really, you can see it in their face, their, their forehead up here, the lines and everything going into their face. They come back to sit and it takes them a while to relax, to, uh, to let go of this tension that they built up trying to go back across the room. I think that it's a, it's a sad thing this was ever, this ever happened. It's a very sad thing. Now, why did it happen? I can give you a, a reason that I think this stuff happens. And the reason I believe it is because with the loss of the actual meaning of the four steps of right effort, everything fell into, we have to do something with these people. What are we gonna do with them? You know, because you're talking to me about wouldn't that calm down the formations arising in your mind? Apparently it wasn't for this person and she wasn't making progress time-wise. So what was happening was she was trying to 6R there, but what she should have been was just walking for her circulation. She also had leg cramps. That one had leg cramps, the other one didn't. She had leg cramps. And then he came down on me and he said, you have to stop them. He said, just stop watching them. You have to stop them. Okay, I'll stop them, <laughs> whatever you want. He wasn't around the first time I started really watching them. When you're doing TWIM, you are completing the four steps of right effort. Now let's break down the four steps. Recognizing an unwholesome mindset and we're letting it go and relaxing. 
And then we're bringing up a smile and coming back, which is a wholesome state. And then we're going to keep the smile going and any other wholesome state. And what is the most wholesome state you can possibly keep going? Keep meditating, right? Your meditation is the highest merit you can have to keep going. So that's your wholesome guideline. And your smile is the second one in line, okay? To keep that going. So these first two, recognizing and releasing, was recognizing and releasing is purification of the mind. Do we agree? Purification of the mind. Now, to purify something, you can't leave it empty. Remember, the universe will not tolerate a vacuum. You cannot just let something go and go back to what you're doing. It'll come right back. And the proof of that is try talking to a bunch of men who are working concentrate on, on any kind of meditation and they're having trouble with the hindrances and they've been having trouble for six or seven months. Ah, and I'm there. How can anybody have trouble for six or seven months? Because nobody is giving out the information about how the hindrance works. So if they're having trouble for, with that coming up and having purify, 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 purify. So what? It's going to come back, isn't it? Because why? because you left a hole. And what is your history for that hole? I go to a retreat, I create the hole and try to make it stay a hole for the retreat and I go home. And what happens at home? The old stuff comes up again. You talk to your friends and find out. Does the stuff stay away when you start working on it if you only let go of it and go home? No. But if you retrain the mind, there's a purification in the first two parts, and then smiling and bringing up the wholesome to, and coming back, that part is the, is the, the, uh, the retraining part of the mind. See? So purification and retraining the mind. And what is the name of the Vasudhi Manga? The, I have it right here. Wait a minute. What's the name of that book? What was it called? What was it called? The path to purification. <laughs> so we're actually providing you with a solution for a path to purification. How did it get lost? Nobody can tell me. But when I heard at this big meeting I was at, I, they started talking about it like one thing and then another thing and then another thing and then another thing. I realized, I realized they never someone told them you have to think of it that way when you read it because when you read it I will confess to you if you have no information about how it actually works you could misunderstand this if you did not have certain uh, information listen to how it sounds when I read it to you you go to 77 okay and you find it when in that sutta you find a description okay I, I proclaimed to my disciples the way to develop the four right kinds of striving. Now, this one says four right kinds of striving, but the other places, it will not say kinds of striving. It'll say four steps of right effort, and it's vastly translated that way instead of saying uh, kinds of striving. Kinds of striving would mean if I recognize that it's enough that's one kind and if i uh, release it that's another kind and if i bring up something that's another kind and if i keep it going that's another kind but the thing is you if you can examine each one individually just like i said you can bring each one to tea and examine them by themselves but to make it work you know how it works you have to turn it into a flowing dance that's happening two or three seconds to recognize, release, relax, we smile, return, repeat. See, you have to have it that working just like that. So here it says, the student will awaken enthusiasm for the non-arising of unarisen, evil, unwholesome states. Now, what does it mean to have enthusiasm for the non-arising of something? You have to know about what they are and how they are unwholesome. And he makes an effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind, and he strives. Strives sounds like a strong word. Do you remember me talking about um, the two armies? The two armies were going to fight each other, and they were going to have a big battle. 
And I said to you in the art of war, there was lessons. One of the 10 things in the art of war uh, was that if you understand where the supply route is, if you destroy the supply route is like, you know, having a siege on a castle where they're all inside, they're going to run out of food and stop fighting. In the case of two armies facing each other, if you take away their supply line, they have a decision. They have to fight immediately or they have to realize they're not getting any more food and they have thousands of men, they have to leave and go home because they have no supplies coming, okay? So what is this an example of? knowledge of how things actually work, or we're going to just go to war with each other and kill thousands and thousands of people. Well, you're going to stay stuck with your hindrances if you're going to fight with them, but I'm telling you how they work. At least it deserves an experiment for four or five days to see if it's real or not what I'm telling you. But if we have the information of how they work, then we know to make an effort to follow the rules with a hindrance. They arouse energy, exert your mind to keep your six R's going. And striving means keep using the six R's because we have this knowledge, keep doing it. The second one, enthusiasm for abandoning. It means for letting go of the unwholesome states. And the third one was abandoning the arisen uh, evil unwholesome states. Okay, then it was the next one was bringing up wholesome states with the same words. The one person will struggle and strive and push. The other person knows how they work. They just let go, step back, and don't feed them anymore. So this comes back to the balance of why is it so important when we teach you TWIM that you are getting a parallel training between meditation and Dhamma. This is why. This is an example of why. After coming to TWIM, I feel that I am a vibrating energy. Mm -hmm. This vibrating energy is creating a lot of formations. And these formations, whatever they are happening, they are impermanent. And these Particularly this formation, with these formations only, the, the world exists. This is what I am feeling and you can explain further whatever I missed. It's very good what you did. Very good. You're producing a vibration of energy, wholesome energy, repeatedly. The formations that come up, you have identified them as impermanent. And the impermanence, if it causes any suffering, is caused by not having enough knowledge about how everything works. The world exists because of these formations. And if you keep letting them go pretty soon, the world doesn't exist and I don't exist. When I don't exist, I'm in the position to fall into cessation. When I fall into cessation, and then I come out of that and rise up, then it is like a newborn brain experience. I love that. That's what the ladies taught me in Pune. I feel like I have a newborn brain, they said. I said I never heard anyone say that before. It's beautiful. I feel like a newborn, a newborn baby on your shoulder and you take the baby outside and the first time they ever see the leaves come out of the tree sticks, you know, the little twigs in the tree and they're turning green and they're opening up. And I took the baby out every day and she looked and she was like, oh, 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 oh. This amazement, what is that? That's wonderment, wonderment, that's wonderment. And that's the wonderment of the baby discovering things is because that child has a newborn brain. And because <laughs> it's new, it's a beautiful kind of okay kind of excitement of seeing. When you go through 
what happens? You go outside, you look at everything. What happens to the greens and the reds and pinks and oranges that you see? It's like technicolor. It's beautiful. If you have experimented with that, next time if you fall through, you go out and sit quietly somewhere where there's a garden. You watch everything and test not just seeing, Odors, sharp as anything. Go have lunch in the next half hour. Taste every little part on your tongue. Hear, fresh as anything. Easier to hear than you would expect because there's pressures all gone away. You have emptied. And you know what you did to your brain? One of the girls told me that too. We rebooted it, sister. It's like the computer turned off and you rebooted it for a restart. And when it came back, the computer is supposed to be clean of any problems. In your case, clean of the past, clean of the future. Just here, now. How are you going to fill that now, that brain? That's up to you. You just gave birth to the baby. How are you going to take care of it when you get home? The, the nurse and doctor are not coming with you. That baby's up to you now. That brain is up to you. That's why what you do with it, how long it stays that way is completely in your hands. You see? It's okay if it doesn't last. You keep practicing. Now you will get to where you fall through and it when you do, it happens more smoothly. And when you see it turn back on, you see it more clearly. Because why? Because it's not a frightening thing that might happen when everything turns off anymore. <laughs> now it's just going in and it's going to come out and you are not afraid of it anymore. No fear at all in it. Now see what happens with it, you see? So this is really, he said it very clearly. Your vibrational energy can heal people. You're learning through the Brahma Viharas how to wake up those four seeds inside you of loving kindness, compassion, joy, equanimity. You're bringing them to a cultivation in the meditation and the, are causally connected. Did you notice how your metta turns into karuna and the karuna turns into joy and goes further into beginning to feel the equanimity? Causal relationship is there just like inside human cognition. And as you do here that, I, here, mm -hmm, yeah. Here I have a question. Yeah. This will not last for more time. Immediately, the moment the fasa come to, comes into the picture by way of uh, six doors or anything, the conceit is coming in the way. <laughs> because <laughs> the, when conceit comes, the position comes. <laughs> position, position comes and immediately we turn to the other relations of the family and other things happening. The moment that we, we open the eyes, the fassa comes into the picture. The, when, I mean, through the fassa, the formations are increasing and uh, we are open, we are uh, immediately coming to the world and uh, seeing that impermanence, whatever you are, whatever is seen earlier, is not continuing forever. <laughs> okay, is, okay. Is the drawback. Do you remember, it's not a drawback. It means you've got work to do. It means that your six R's are not automatic yet. Do you remember the man in New York City I told you about who took a walk with his wife in the evening? Do you remember I told you that the van guy with these other guys inside these characters would harass them and curse at them and everything? And do you remember I told you this, this one car stopped at the light and the van harassed it? It was behind it. And the man said, he came back and he wrote me, he said, you know, the funniest thing happened tonight. I said, what happened? He said, normally I get really uptight when they show up and I 
detest that they're cursing and screaming foul language out their van window and scaring this woman who stopped at the light. And I want to do something, but something different happened tonight. I said, what happened? What happened? Tell me. He said, all of a sudden, there was nothing coming up and I was sending them meta. And you know what? They stopped yelling at me and then they drove away. They didn't harass us while we were walking. They just went away and they didn't go around the block and come back to harass us before we went home. They just left. Well, how did that happen? He said, because of how your brain works. Everyone's brain works by retraining through repetitious of the same thing you want the brain to be doing. Going back into neural pathways in the brain and habitual tendencies. This is a, you, you're craving, you're, you're listening now. Now here's another example for you. The other student, she went home into the house with the people. And I told you, she came down the stairs one day to come downstairs from where she was working upstairs. And as she came down the stairs, she heard them in the room arguing. Normally she would walk down the stairs and walk into the room and then take a position. <laughs> and she said, I didn't wanna do it anymore. What's wrong with me? I said, tell me exactly how it happened. She went down the stairs. She said, I saw them like a movie in front of me, but I wasn't in the movie anymore. What does that mean? It means the brain got to a place where it isn't going to accept this stuff as being me, mine, and myself anymore. So where is the weakness in the training? Or where do you need to work? Say it that way. Where do I need to work? This is not me. This is not mine. This is not myself. You keep telling your brain. This is just noise. These people are making noise. And you're in an environment of untrained people just like she is. You, you mean to say that the ignorance is overpowering me at that particular juncture? This is not mine, this is not me, or something I am not uh, following and immediately... You're identifying what you're doing if you're still, if it's still going in and disturbing me, then it's mine. It's myself. I'm there. This is part of me. No, it's not. You see, you go back to your dependent origination seven link chart. You look at exactly what happened and write it on a piece of white paper for me. You walked in that room, you heard the sound of these people. And then with that painful feet, it turned into a painful feeling immediately and slid into, I don't like this. They're going to disturb my Advancement in meditation. No, nothing is happening to you, Sarma. Everything is happening from you. Ha, ha, ha. You got caught. See, that's where we get caught. So now it's a game. You, you, she started to work more when she heard it at all. She's working upstairs. If they start screaming and yelling and fighting, you know, she's just, this is not me. This is not mine. This is not myself. This is just noise and it goes away farther and farther away. You don't have to go, you know, there's a, actually it's a funny thing. And it's, I think there were some Christians that were Buddhist, <laughs> but in Christianity, we say, Christ said, you can be in this world, but do not be of this world. And that is a link between Buddhism and Christianity. Be in this world, but not of this world means you are in the world and have to deal with it. But it is not me. It is not mine. It is not myself. It is what it is essentially. So put it away, is Sarma. That's the deal. And you have to train the brain to do it automatically. And it will. I know you. You, you have, can do, you have good training and you have good lengths of time. So you Start doing it outside of a sitting. Train yourself wherever you are, whatever you're doing. It's not me. This is not mine. It's not myself. This is just this incident. That's how I have to take care of it. A car crashed once in New Jersey. 
big accident on a highway and we were just behind it. And I said, Doug, and he said, okay, I pulled over on the road. We went over to the car, pulled the people out. Car was going to be on fire shortly and started on fire, pulled the people out, laid them down. Other people called the police. We were near an exit. People came very quickly. This is called Good Samaritan stuff. You just do it and forget you did it. But this is what we did. And then the police come, they say to you one thing, what happened? And we knew what had happened. A guy had pulled in front of his car at 60 miles an hour and he had to go somewhere and he went over the hump into the air and came down on another car and then landed on the grass on the other side. The other car guy, he was dead. The person in this car was punctured through the chest and the woman who his fiance was going hysterical when she had hurt herself, but we just got her out on one side and on the other side on the ground. We knew how to take their pulse. We knew how to strap down any bleeding parts. The policeman said, what did you know? I said, this is what happened. And the guy who's responsible is miles away, gone. No one to blame except the car that cut in front of the other car. He said, you need to leave, go ahead, go. That was it, never even took our name. It's how they do it in the States. It's called Good Samaritan, story of the Good Samaritan. But the thing is not important. Why did I do that? Because my grandmother told me that if I don't do it for other people, she drilled us when I was small. If you don't help another person, when the same thing happens to you, nobody is going to pick you up. She drilled it into us when we were small at the seashore every year. Always remember that because it's all connected. Everything is connected. Because see, you're all made out of the same thing. All of us are made out of the same thing. And look where I am right now. Stardust. We're all made of stardust. There's no difference. We have to figure that out as a human race or we are not going to survive. And we've been around this before. They've uncovered cities that were holding 10 and 20,000 people underground. Tunnels underneath Europe that go 600 and 800 miles or more, 1,200 miles, one of them, underneath Europe. Some reason, at some point, way back, everybody went underground. So it's not the first time that the surface is suffering the way that we think it's suffering. You know, we, we see it suffering, yeah. We're not thinking it's there, it really is there. So we have to stay connected. It's all part of it, you see? So when you're in the world, always remember, you can be in it, but not of the world. And always remember, nothing's happening to you. It's all happening from you, from your interpretation of it. Did I take it personally? Is it aimed at me, mine, myself? I just made it mine and myself when I thought it was aimed at me. No, it's somebody, if, if they're getting loud and they're speaking to you, somebody who hurts inside, you know, and something happened to them. And they're angry and they're actually yelling at themselves, not you at all. Always remember that. And then help them. Get them some ice cream. Mm. Get them some ice cream or, you know, I know we're over here in, you know, Asia. Get them some tea. Okay. It's South America. Get them coffee quickly. 